All right, who's awake? He raised, woo! Get some of that. All right. Oh, I'm, I'm alive. Oh, mm-hmm. you raised your hand too. He's awake. Panelist is awake. That's important. One. All right, One. so we know we have some things working against us. We are the panel before beer. Got it. So we're going to have a little fun. We're going to have a nice discussion here about the future of television. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to kind of set the context a little bit, maybe just a couple of minutes, some slides, um, not a lot of words, a lot of pictures, but just talking a little bit about you know, how we've been predicting the, the future of television for a lot of years. So back in 1920s, this man named Hugo Gernsback uh, published something called Science and Innovation. And what he predicted on this cover of this 1928, this 1922 issue was about the first color broadcast signal. So even back then, people were trying to imagine what is the television experience going to look like? And I'll read you this quote um, that he had in the magazine. It said, in 20 years, universal television will be an everyday affair. It will be possible to talk over the telephone to your friend a thousand miles away and see him at the self-same time. The same thing will be true in radio where you will see what is being broadcast at all times. Television still holds some great surprises for us, and the applications in television may well revolutionize our entire mode of living, just as a telephone has revolutionized it. So again, back in the day, people were trying to figure out, what is TV really going to be like? And in 1928, he he predicted 3D television, 3D movies. So going to the movies and putting on stereoscopic glasses or seeing stereoscopic pictures on the big screen. So again, it's this concept of predicting the future of TV is not something that's you know necessarily new to us. Now we've done lots of more predicting. So in the 50s, people were predicting about holographic pictures coming out of the screens at you. And they were even predicting things like television signals being broadcast directly to your brain. So again, some crazy stuff that people were trying to imagine about what the future of television was going to be like. Now in the 80s, when the personal computer got really exciting, got really, you know, if everybody was talking about the PC, people were imagining how that would shape television. And in this case, it was talking about maybe interacting with the television signal itself. So imagine, you know, being involved with holographic images of a play and being one of the actors on stage. Now, of course, we've talked about television as it exists today and what it might look like tomorrow and we're coming up with new ideas. You know, maybe it's going to be virtual reality or maybe it's going to be something that we've been predicting for a long time. We've been talking about wearing things on our faces for years. Or it could even be something that's a combination of mixed reality with a headset. So again, this is from Microsoft HoloLens, this concept of being able to watch television and have images and information displayed alongside the TV signal. And there's even some people that have predicted that the future of television is all about apps. So that kind of sets the context for what we're going to talk about today, a really high-level discussion about what is the future of the television experience as we shift from linear broadcast to online delivery. And just a little bit about me, I am Jason Tebow, the executive director of the Streaming Video Alliance. And we are a global consortium of companies, we're a not-for-profit, dedicated to building best practices for online video. And this is just some of our member companies that are involved in this process of trying to create a standard, consistent way to deliver online video. And what I want to do next is I want to have our esteemed panel here introduce themselves. And we'll start here at the end with Roger, and we'll kind of walk through them all. And once we get to the end, we'll dive into our questions and really start this discussion about the future of television. So Roger. Hi, I'm Roger Williams, uh, Senior Vice President, uh, MLB Advanced Media, slash BAMTech, newly minted BAMTech. I've um, been working there for about 10 years, running the gamut of working with, obviously, baseball, but also our partners, a, a, a wide range of partners on a wide range of TVE, OTT, as well as uh, aggregated platform uh, digital media products out there in the space. Um, so it's been a great journey. Looking forward to this discussion. Hi, I'm Gabriella Mirabelli, and I'm from Anatomy Media, and we're a marketing and branding firm for entertainment brands. So we create the trailers and promotions that convince you to stream, binge, <laughs> and watch things obsessively. And we also conduct surveys of young millennials to look at how they're consuming media to help our clients, who are mostly entertainment brands, understand better the challenges they're facing, and how to meet those challenges. My name is Keith Valerie. I'm the CEO of Plex. 
Uh, Plex is a media app that allows uh, people to manage all of their uh, media, stored media, like movies and TV shows, uh, music, uh, home videos, photos, things like that. Makes it beautiful, adds a lot of related content in, and then streams it out to uh, virtually every streaming device that, uh, that matters today. Um, we have about uh, 10 million registered users um, and uh, have kind of four-star rated apps on, on every major platform. We recently uh, integrated DVR capability into the app and are starting to look at more online uh, uh, capabilities as well, online content and uh, over-the-top content. So super interested in this discussion and uh, happy to be a part of it. Um, my name is Jens Löffner, Principal Technical Evangelist um, at Adobe in, in the Adobe Primetime team. Um, I've been working with streaming media, I think starting 2002. I had a blog since 2003. Um, actually, I looked, I looked at my profile here when, when um, uh, you know, joining the panel. I think my bio was from 2007 when I was first at Streaming Media East here. So many years of experience around streaming, DRM, how really the first attempts of like mobile streaming evolved and now really working very actively with media companies uh, and cable companies on their solutions. So very involved with a lot of the OTT offerings uh, that we've seen that, that use Adobe technology, um, spending a lot of time also with uh, Roger and his team at Demtech, so uh, many years there too. So really on the pulse of sort of, you know, where the industry is heading to, but also obviously very interested uh, in the future and I'm happy to share my uh, wide predictions here to understand. Fantastic. Thank you all very much for those introductions. All right, let's get into it. So the television experience is changing. I think everyone agrees that that's the case, that consumers are watching content from a variety of devices, from a variety of different places. It's no longer, you know, sit on your couch and be sort of forced to watch what's being delivered to you. Um, what are some of the challenges associated with these kinds of changes in viewer behavior? I mean, what, what do content owners, what do content distributors, what are they going to have to do to meet this new demand for the way people are watching TV differently? Well, at least with particularly uh, baseball and uh, NHL, which mm -hmm. um, from a, a band perspective we have the uh, digital rights for, and our partners, um, the distinction is between, or at least trying to reach uh, in a meaningful way, and Obviously, with the OTT product space that we play in, it's, it's a far more, or at least we try to have a more engaging experience, um, more contextual beyond your traditional uh, media distribution delivery um, of your static, let's say, game metaphor. Um, so I think that's a, a key distinction of what we try to do, but um, all of our partners have different fulcrums. So I, I think the challenge that they meet in uh, trying to achieve reach is whether they rely on a platform to get that level of engagement versus a, a very specific ODT tailored offering that um, accentuates some of the benefits of their inherent to their product. So um, I, I think what we see in a lot of traditional content providers is uh, the challenge for them is to essentially deliver uh, their content um, in a more meaningful and to rise above the clutter uh, and to achieve discovery above your traditional um, platform, uh, moving away from, or at least uh, compared again to the pay TV, traditional pay TV channels to a uh, more aggregated, let's say, virtual MVPD space. Um, what we've seen is a high level engagement and a high degree of other monetization opportunities when you have an OTT play where you can leverage things like specialized ad targeting, merchandise plays, ticketing plays, uh, much more meaningful um, engagement uh, with the co uh, consumer when you can go direct to OTT. But then the challenge is how many brands can a cons consumer really maintain in their quiver? Um, I, I, I believe uh, in the space that folks are saying that most users can consistently uh, you use maybe two digital media products, three. Um, so I think that's a major challenge for a lot of folks. Um, to piggyback off of Tim Cook's, it's all about apps. When everybody's delivering their own apps, it's really hard to rise above uh, the clutter and, and rise above what some may consider noise uh, to be able to reach and 
um, extend uh, to what they want to do with their customer and what they want to do with the product. Yeah, and I think, that's why I agree with that. I also think one of the, the issues is for an app like yours and an app like many, when you, you're actually creating a destination, it's a, you're actually appealing to kind of super fans, having an app makes a lot more sense. If you're uh, creating more general content, TV shows and movies, having an app when there's 3,000 apps is a very difficult place to be in, right? So from a content, we talked to a lot of content providers who were saying like, look, you know, we have to build a bunch of apps for a lot of different platforms to try and get to our users. That's a difficult thing to do in its own right. And then, even if I make a good app, you know, trying to get that content in the top 10 or top 20 most watched apps is a really, really difficult play. And if you flip that on its head, you have the same, the, the users have the same problem, right? Like if I know I love uh, baseball or I Twitch or, or whatever, then I'm gonna go there and it's, a, it's kind of a destination site made for me. Um, but if I'm just looking for something to watch or I'm looking for that one thing, having to go in and out of a whole bunch of different apps and, and user experiences is, is a real challenge. Well, that's, so. yeah, it's all about discovery for the user and how do you, you know, you've already seen everything, what are you gonna watch next? In your right. time, your scarcity of time, it's not just money, you don't have a lot of time to find it, and also monetization and how you, as the creator of content, especially original, scripted, very expensive content, how do you monetize that? And those are, that's the challenge that I see. Yeah, the, I think the um, obviously in, in the cable model, you have 800 channels. If you subscribe to everything, 900 channels, and you're sort of facing the same situation where people maybe subscribe for eight, nine channels. They want to watch MLB content, ESPN, maybe you know, obviously they get Fox and others for you know sort of included already HBO, and that's almost the same with TV every application. There's a few that really attract an audience because they have great content, but then once you pass that that point of of main attraction. Like, how do, you, how do you, first of all, have people find a destination? Is it basically, this, is it Hulu or is it basically a, a new offering? But then also, how do I basically show them the breadth of the content, right? So it's very easy to say, hey, I'm going to have a lot of people install an HBO app because of Game of Thrones, or I'm going to install an MVP app because it's this great game. But how do you do this once you're in that tier where you're really not on that top tier and you're trying to uh, mirror the breadth of your co the content to someone. First of all, have them install your app. So it's a lot about marketing. I think that's, um, I think it's been sort of an afterthought. It's like, how do I market my application? How do I drive audiences? But now um, it's, I mean, it's not easy to deliver content at high quality, especially with TV quality ex um, expectations at maybe 4K too. Monetization is also a challenge, but I think equally important is how do I actually market this now in a way that's intelligent and actually have a high subscription number? I think that's where I've seen a lot of the, sort of the, the mid-tier offerings really struggling trying to get this broad user base, but I think there's a lot of things we can do in the future to make that better. So something that you guys just talked about, uh, which is really interesting, is content discovery. So obviously as more OTT players come into the market and there's more online content, you have linear broadcast, um, you know, you know, actually Apple just announced a new application that's going to aggregate content from their other apps on the Apple TV platform. So it's a really cool opportunity to create kind of like a, an Uber TV guide for all the content you subscribe to. But you know, beyond that, let's say you're, you know, you're outside the Apple TV ecosystem, you know, how do you make content more discoverable? How, how, what can you do, what can a content owner do, what can anybody do to make it so that consumers can find content more easily? Well, I think he just talked about what the content owners are trying to do. There's so, you know, social activities, marketing activities, things that the, you can try and do to, to market that technology. But frankly, the tools aren't great. Given, given the paradigm and the ecosystem, you've got 3,000, 4,000 apps you're trying to compete with, that's difficult. So um, at the same time, I think you know, users, users are gonna demand better tools for doing it. I think Apple's announcement is super cool. You know, Roku's doing a lot of things around universal search as well. Um, uh, but it's, that's limited as well. You know, my belief on it is that, uh, and I actually know of a couple of small companies that are already working on this, that you're going to have um, kind of universal guides, universal search, uh, companies that are putting real dollars associated with um, in, essentially indexing video on the internet, right? And that's a big hard problem, but someone's got to do it uh, because otherwise, you know, doing it on a platform by platform basis is painful for the apps. You probably know this, right? You've got to write to every single one. That's painful. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so I think that is a problem that's ripe to be solved. It's a valuable problem. Someone will solve it. And that, that'll, I think, open up um, discovery and make it much more easy to not to just do the guide, but to do search and recommendation and notifications and watch lists, all the kind of universal everything, I think, will become a reality there. Right, where it's a real video Sherpa to, <laughs> right. to guide my, you exactly, where you need to be. My, my companion kind of thing. Right. I think, I think what's really interesting was when Google tried this with Google TV, the searchability of all content, and basically was linking two different websites without really that, that content owner being involved in that process. Well, so I think that really led to... That's the trick. That's the exactly, that's the trick. I think that's the, how do I, how do I make it discoverable? How, do, how does my search engine or my discovery engine be able to cover everything, but I'm not starting to go over the content owner and trying to violate... Well, because the content the owner, that's their data, and your consumption right. of their programming is their money. And so they're not going to give it away easily. And so that's why you're going to have these sort of enlarged walled gardens. You're going to have a la carte network groups, maybe, where you, you see consolidation in large groups. So it's thinner. But there, there really has to be an incentive for them to give and share. I mean, and what happens is piracy, because one of the, cons the consumers want it all in one place, and the pirates will give it to you. Yeah. And, and Marion on the other side, so there's the discovery from the customer facing aspect, but from a content origination perspective, there's certainly a movement to have a unique identifier for that source piece of content that federates through the entire system. Mm. Uh, so you can actually get, or ideally get to the place where you have better analytics, a notion of valuation through the standard windowing of whether it's a script to TV model of syndication and uh, rights federation thereafter. Um, and so I, that's a, a very tall hill to climb, but I, I know that's certainly, that's certainly in the works right now to have that notion of this discrete piece of content and, and, and any of its incarnations to really carry across that identifier um, and how it ultimately gets con consumed and, and valued in the end. So as we start to talk about content discovery, one of the things that invariably comes up is choice. So if we're talking about content discovery being difficult, it's because there's so much content out there to be found. So how does, you know, what's going to happen in the future with consolidation? You know, obviously we've got an announcement to buy Time Warner. There are other content owners out there. There are other network operators out there. Everyone's looking at the content space. What do you think consolidation is going to do to the television experience in the future? Is it going to be a single sign-on? I get a login and all my content's there because there's just a few content providers. I mean. Can you, can you give me some opinions on that? I, I, I was going to say, first of all, I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's, the consolidation right now, I don't think necessarily means there's going to be fewer content providers in the future. That's, that's one guy's opinion. I right. think too much is made of, of those acquisitions. I actually read a really cool thing, uh, I can't remember, uh, from Business Insider, I think. It was, it was an interesting presentation about uh, consol kind of again, kind of an Orwellian consolidation thing um, taking place from the big manufacturers, where they control access, like the device that you're using and the operating system and the uh, app ecosystem, and they they control discovery, the search, the social, and and, and then they control the wallet and, and payment programs, and that somehow that's going to result in um, that all content kind of funneling through that. And I just don't, I don't think that's the case. I think with, <clears throat> with the app ecosystem, you kind of let, you let it out of the box, right? Now, you know, anybody uh, can put money behind, and the barriers have been reduced to, to essentially put money behind creating apps and, and uh, funding, um, funding content. I think that's going to persist. Like, the, the, there's already momentum behind that, and so the, the technologies are going to have to shift to, to provide for that. So I personally think too much is made of the, the consolidation. I, I mean, I hope, I'm optimistic that we saw this with Comcast and NBCU happening, yeah. and obviously all the content remains the same and the quality, so oh. hopefully there's no big impact. But from our authentication piece, or from login pers um, perspective, obviously I have, um, I've, you know, obviously a, a viewpoint there too um, with Adobe, basically um, enabling most of the TV everywhere authentication. And so, um, I mean, that has been a struggle for, for, for quite some time where people can't, you know, can't remember that. Um, credentials and um, there's a huge drop off rate. So there's the initiatives like in-home authentication or IPO-based authentication, 
social in, um, authentication. So the industry is moving. It's moving slowly, but it's moving. So hopefully, at least that authentication piece will, will come down to is a single login. Once you authenticate, it will carry over um, across all those different brands. I think that's, that's a big challenge. Obviously, if you have to manage, if you have 20 OTT offerings and you have 20 passwords and combinations, hopefully it's not just the same password everywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> Then you know that becomes a challenge. But I mean, beyond the discoverability, obviously, the um, having a unified experience, at least to a certain degree, I think is key. Well, I, I, I disagree. I think we are going to see some consolidation, some pretty big consolidation. I think you're going to see it at NBCU, and I think you're going to see it at Turner. Um, John Martin was just saying, you know, we're it's going to be winnowed. It's going to be ruthless. There are too many, and certainly the cost of the high-end original scripted stuff is such that. E you can't, you know, you can't have Esquire Channel make one original show. It just isn't economically feasible. So you're going to see consolidation, at least among those players. And you may have other long tail, small niche markets, but they're just not going to be the, the behemoths. You know, you, they're going to be competing on a different, no. I think you're going to have subscription that's going to work with these network groups. And then you're maybe going to have ad driven narrow, narrow, but it's the quality level is going to be different. I mean, what is content? That, that's how, you know, you, content can be a huge thing, but when you're talking about the amount it costs to make this content and the speed with which people go through it. Right. So know. this, this may, it's a little pie in the sky, but a, a alternative view is that as the, you know, one view is to say um, media has not really been disrupted yet by technology. Right? That's if you fair. kind of look could, at the whole yeah. value chain of, of media creation, and that, uh, and I didn't make any of this up, so I can't take credit for it. But, <laughs> oh, you should uh, take, credit. <laughs> take credit. Very, but very the, smart. But the kind of the content creators have been, you know, they're the ones that are kind of been um, disenfranchised a bit. And, and the question is, over time, if it becomes a producer-led world, you know, can, can, technologies, can technologies provide um, kind of safer and more transparent platforms that make it easy for that to connect brand dollars and advertising dollars directly to the content creators and get content uh, ideally, out there. So they can ideally, do one yes. or two shows and, it's, and they can be amazing. But I mean, for instance, you have, I was talking to Tracy Johnson, created Blue's Clues, huge, huge success, Love right? Blue's Clues. Amazing success. She's like, oh my God, I can make my show by myself now with the great technology. And it was really, really hard. Yeah. You know, YouTube isn't interested because she doesn't have an existing following. She has shows on Amazon, she had shows on PBS, Blue's Clues, and still it's not there because even with that level of, of background track record, the discovery piece, that last bit, is owned by these people that they can really pump it out. And you know, and to go to how does discovery change, I think we're seeing a reemergence, a renaissance of traditional PR, where you're getting placed, you know, articles written, things like that, that becomes more important. Social, you know, the way people respond to social cues, their friends are the most important recommendation, and then real people rather than yeah. you know, uh, traditional promotion. But, but there's obviously a role of um, the established media organization, which you, know, you could say Netflix is similar in that, in that way now, where they curate the content. And where only really very few shows out of the big portfolio of that we can select is getting promoted and put on their channel. Well, right? it's, yeah, it's which a, is it's, on the very top tier, basically. Right, they're, they're, it's a general network with narrow things. The, the House of Cards viewer is not the same as the Hemlock Grove viewer. Different. Right. I, I think of it, um, I, I, I think it's actually two phases going on right now because I, I feel like it's pretty much high time for content creators because uh, you have so many different, even, even though um, <laughs> anecdotally this, this, this wow. one story doesn't tell us a, a great tale. I don't know tale. if I buy it. But at least you can conceivably option two different um, networks. I, I yeah, you have more outlets. Yeah, you have more outlets. Netflix That's is true. A network. I would consider Hulu, Amazon, Amazon as a sure. network option, um, or you know the migratory pattern of having your YouTube channel and then migrate into a more traditional network uh, option. But I, I do feel like there's a coming second coming second wave of consolidation to where um, at, at least cash on hand and the largest that an Apple or an Amazon can bring to actually make their presence known in a content aggregation platform play. 
mm -hmm. um, is fundamentally larger, just straight market cap, just straight cash on hand, engineering horsepower, execution sure. potential. Um, that is actually, a, I would say, I wouldn't call it existential, but it, it does represent another wave of consolidation that can conceivably happen. Um, that you can conceivably get to a point where there are a few number of content aggregation platforms as opposed to the wide disparate Wild West notion that we have right now. Um, so I, I, I'm always curious in watching that level of, at least when you look at Facebook, Apple, Amazon, uh, compared to you know, your standard network plays, your standard peer plays like a Netflix, to see where they go because they're observing and then they're going to make their move or their play. Um, and I don't want to say, to, I, I don't consider it dark necessarily, but I, I think there is going to be another digital, a wave of, of digital media consolidation as well, of yeah, what like users experience. The question I have is like, will it be used for good or evil? <laughs> right? Like, you, you know, because again, if you take that kind of the control access, discovery, and, and purchase, mm -hmm. the, the, the thesis of this article that I was reading was basically saying like, I control that whole thing, so I'm going to actually tell the creators what to create because I know what they care about and I know what they're watching. And so it essentially gets myopic and creativity kind of goes away. Mm -hmm. So that's one horrible evil path. Or it's, okay, we, we, we essentially use this really robust platform that has amazing search technologies that we never had before, social technologies we never had before, and essentially level the playing field a little bit for creators to come in and, and do good things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of rooting for the latter. I mean, yeah, data and the definite um, technology. Uh, and, and, and I guess, you know, I would go farther to say, and maybe it's controversial to say that if, they, if it isn't the latter, then it, they're going to fail. And so you may have this wave of consolidation, but it'll fail and other platforms will pop up to make sure that, um, that people aren't over influenced in what they're going to watch and that creators have a, a, an ability to be creative. Yep. And that maybe sounds a little too optimistic, but that's kind of my... I think you're probably right in one sense <laughs> because the young, the sort of the young millennials and the digital natives, increasingly authenticity is really important to them. And so anything that feels top down, that feels fed, that feels too contrived is rejected. So. Well, in, in talking about consolidation, we have opened up Pandora's box to talk about business models. So the future of television, if it's moving towards online delivery, it's moving towards online consumption, does an ad supported model still work? No. <laughs> I, I, I actually I disagree with that. I, I, I think it, it is amazing when you when you uh, expose like millennials who've never had cable, and then you give them a cable box. Like, what are all these ads? This is crazy. <laughs> uh, but I, I think within certain content classes, obviously sports and breaking news and the, you know election debates and things like that. Um, you, which have no ads. Which have no ads because they continue to debate through the entire window, but um, there's just a, a natural, uh, and I, I guess I'm not completely objective on this in, of what I do for a living, but from a live sports perspective, the immediacy and the value of live consumption is, I mean, it goes without saying, it, it, it's just higher value. And so ad supported delivery within that notion is pretty critical. And folks who take a half inning break from a baseball perspective, they want time to be filled with something. Um, I know some folks are just fine with just, just slate over it, I don't care. Um, but ad tech, I think, is still, I don't want to call it nascent, but I, I, it, if I had the human development metaphor, I would say it's in its tweens to really leverage truly targeted decisioning and trafficking and serving to a finite level within the digital media space. Um, it's, it's not, I don't think it's fully mature enough yet to really leverage what it could be. So you could actually have something that's meaningful that gets targeted in the middle of your uh, quarter break or uh, from a soccer perspective, half the, uh, the mid-match break. Um, and I think that level of targeting from an ad perspective is inherently more valuable than your traditional burn-ins that everybody sees the same ads. I, 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 I think the thing is that um, the, the, millenni the digital natives, the millennials, two-thirds of them right now are ad blocking on mm -hmm. digital consumption. So they just never get the ad. Two and 
two thirds, we did a survey on this, it's crazy, two thirds of them. And so, and there, this is only going to um, migrate, I think. You know, once you, I, what we found was, it was highly correlated with piracy, but once they got the ad blocker, which they probably got in order to avoid the ads that they were getting when they were pirating content, they were like, wow, this is a great experience, I don't get any of the ads. And so, there's going to be, you know, I mean, like for instance, where did the millennial audience go when they were streaming the Olympics? Well, two thirds of them were ad blocking. That's where they went. Mm -hmm. And so coming up with a way to deal with that, I, I mean, I think, I think live content is definitely a special case. Mm -hmm. I think sports, people show up, yep. it's, it's a love. It's a timeout, what are you gonna do during the timeout? Well, I, but, I, but I do think that the, the ad experience could be better, it could be more relevant, and there's where your targeting comes in, and not repetitive, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that for other things, like the scripted things, I think you have to look at subscription, uh, at least in a digital space, rather than the advertising, because I think people, or you've got to develop a second stream of content where it's right. branded content. Yeah, I, so I think I think the, the the balance between subscription and ad supported I think again depends on um, the um, the content that you have, right? I mean, obviously it's much easier to watch content even if you have watch ads or use an ad blocker, not watch ads, but you reach a different audience unless you have really a brand where people want to subscribe to. But um, I think from my from an ad perspective, um, I think the I mean the, the the way broadcast works is just horrible, right? I mean it's totally untargeted. It's basically um, traffic against the content, not, not, not against the audience. So if you're Star Trek, with Star Trek, you get some you know, Star Trek specific content, even though that might not be the audience segment you're in. Um, and it just, you know, really long breaks to, like, to an excessive amount where it's just not very natural anymore. And I think there's, with IP video, knowing about the user and being able to do things creatively around advertisement, it becomes more natural and becomes maybe even more blended into the content. And the way it is, I think there's a lot to do there to make advertising actually feel a lot more friendly and a lot better for the end user and make it a better experience, even if it's just about the seamless experience. Like if you go to a lot of websites, you see really just bad ad overlays and you know, things like, I think the illegal websites you mentioned there when people you know, would pirate, they get you know, five block up. Oh, right, and so and they, they get the There's pirate. a lot of really bad things and bad practices around advertisement. So, I think what the ad tech industry needs to figure out, and, and, and I think that's happening, um, is to really find a model that is, that is not countering um, the trend of ad blocking with, well, I'm just forcing you to watch it so the ad blocker doesn't work, right. but more with be changing the model so it becomes a much more friendlier model because I think the reality is to, to, this, this industry wouldn't exist without advertising, this, the media in, in, in this industry. I don't think that you could have this operation that we have today run without advertisement on the subscription fee level. Just so so I'm, I don't have any advertising experience at all, uh, so I'm kind of a, an audience member for this one, but the way I kind of view it is it seems like it should be different for long form content TV shows and movies, like short form, like you were saying, short form and, and, um, and live types of things make sense during those natural breaks to have some targeted advertising. But man, I'm using Netflix and HBO, and you don't have any. Once you get hooked on, hey, it costs me whatever it is, ten bucks, and I don't have any commercials. It's hard to go back. Right, it's really right hard especially if you're having a complex narrative. <clears throat> Try following True Detective if you had ads. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was hard to follow. Yeah, but, I mean, the question is, like, let's say you have like a lower tier uh, content that's, you know, maybe a self-produced show that you know is really well done, really good actors. <laughs> And you have the option between watching a pre-roll or paying ten dollars a month just to get this, this you know, lower, less attractive. I mean, at HBO and Netflix, I think nobody's doubting it's worth the money to, to spend ten dollars a month, right? But I think the key is like, how do you get to certain content that you wouldn't subscribe to, right? And that, I think that's the key there. You know, how does that revenue? I mean, I think yep. even on YouTube, people get ad revenue, right? That's how the whole yeah. YouTube. That's why I say the works. short form definitely makes. Yeah. My kids watch, you know, can sit through two hours. But I bet they have ad blockers. And oh I also God. think this, um, they the, sponsor, do. the sponsorship they model is also um, I'm right. I'm sorry. Um, updating to the point of, I mean, vice, empl vice employees, vice media employees is a lot with branded and sponsored right. content. Like it, it's not necessarily intrusive ad breaks, but this entire production piece is branded and sponsored by somebody, um, or. You see it in sports too, where this particular graphics package or treatment is branded by some 
um, by a, a company. And, and I think those type of opportunities also present um, a new means of uh, ad, do ad dollars going in that direction. And I totally agree, you know, it's scripted television, um, your standard content that's susceptible to more time shifting and time dilation of, of when users consume, uh, there's less resistance and less uh, elasticity around uh, willingness to enjoy or consume ads. But, you know, but at the same time, there's natural cadence of certain programming that you have to fill that space. Um, and, and, you know, I, I said it before, and then I, I'm concurring with Jens, who I've worked with over the years, but uh, I, I, it's, it can be so much better. Right, you know, not the same Geico exactly. ad 20 times in a row. Mm -hmm, precisely. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that, and that brings up, you know, an interesting topic, because you guys have mentioned it a few times. So just listening to you talk, you've talked about millennials and, you know, digital natives and, you know, what does age have to do with this television experience, with this new television experience? Are there things that content owners and distributors have to keep in mind about different demographics, you know, millennials versus Gen Z versus boomers? Are there things that they're going to have to keep in mind as they start to redefine this television experience? Well, I think that people's behaviors are pretty durable. And so, in some ways, the people who grew up with television are more willing to have the television experience in a traditional way and even see that same experience in a digital way. But if, you, if you've only grown up seeing content without commercials, it's jarring to have those commercials. I mean, originally with television, remember the programming was the candy coating to deliver an ad to you. It, the product wasn't the, the show. The product was the ad in television. And it was movies where the, the movie was the product. And then Netflix disrupted that. You know, and it made the, it made the show the product. Yeah, I would... Oh, go oh, go, no, you go ahead. Uh, I, I think, at least from a cohort uh, development through their own um, years of gaining more affluence in the workforce, you, you get some distinguishing uh, behaviors as it pertains to visual, uh, digital consumption as well. So, uh, you know, someone who's weaned on free clips on YouTube and going past all the pre-rolls and just <laughs> clicking past everything, there, there comes a point where they <clears throat> gain affluence and they're more willing to pay for, you know, subscription products. And, um, and I think what's coming is their willingness to pay for multiple subscription products in the digital space. Um, and I think that's, I think too, too much, probably for the erring on the side of simplicity is just given to the sense of, oh, millennials just hate ads and they don't want to pay for anything. But I, I think that we're, we're seeing probably over the next couple of years, you're going to see folks um, advance into a more mature notion of what they're willing to pay I, for. I think that the experience has to be there because like right now, the millennials, 58% of them are sharing passwords. Mm -hmm. So they're getting that experience. They're not paying for it. Why on earth would they pay for it? Mm -hmm. So you've got to make the, you know, people will spend a lot of money for a phone. And so the joyful spend, if they get that experience, so it's really the user experience has to be worth it. If they've got time scarcity, and it answers the time scarcity, if pirating becomes convoluted, mm -hmm. if, if you get binged off because it's simultaneous streams, um, or it's not, the, you're not the actual subscriber, and you make it inconvenient for them to, to do these workarounds. But right now, you've got, you know, 69% of them are pirating, and 67% don't think there's anything wrong with pirating. And it, it's really hard to change a behavior that people don't think is wrong. Mm -hmm. And if they're doing it and they're experiencing it, what are you giving them that's better? Fair enough. But um, I, think, I think a world of only piracy would lead to a very different content catalog for all Well, of ab absolutely. And I think the thing is, though, you know, the kid, my 15-year-old, doesn't care. So how do I get him to care? I mean, he'll care when the content's gone, but that's too late. So how do you change the behavior? How do you change the attitude before the content hits the wall? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think piracy and ad blocking, I think that's definitely a, a, a big you know, trend in that. In that um, and I think, I mean, obviously, ad blocking, I mean, we're also talking about like television experience. Like, you turn on your television, there's no cable on there. It's apps, right? Which is less impacted by ad blocking and more the TV experience. But I think the, um, in general, the, the, the millennials are, I think, first of all, if you have any kind of content and you, it's not on every screen, it's not on the iPad, it's not on your television, it's not reachable. You, you sort of lost um, th that generation already. 
And I think the other thing is like the, um, I think we're going to see new content categories. I think the one most fascinating thing I think in the last couple of years is the rise of online gaming, live streaming, right? It's like, that's like something that's, that came out of nowhere. There was no media executive said, hey, let's create this new content category, which is streaming PlayStation games live, right? It, was, it came out of nowhere and it created this whole business, right? And that's sort of like, it's obviously a new generation comes in, has a different view, has different toolkits. And I think that's the kind of things we really need to um, look out for, right? Adjust your um, senses towards like, what is really the, what are the millions or even what the, what's, you know, teenagers, what, what is like, what is really the content that they're looking for, right? And being agile. Yeah, and, the, and the, la the one thing I'd add to that, and this is kind of coming from a, a company whose, you know, our, our job is building user experience uh, for media apps, is the, the problem that we're having with the generational gap is how do you actually, you have to present one user experience that's going to meet both. Mm. So a kind of a, kind of an unsexy in the weeds problem that we're dealing with right now is do you, you know, going forward, do you kind of take the DVR paradigm towards all other content? So, you know, people who grew up with a DVR and you could say, okay, I want to record that show and you're essentially curating some shows that you're going to watch over time. That's kind of the way we think of it. The, the surveys that we've done, when you look at younger people, they don't really want that. It's more of a lean back kind of uh, experience. So they just, they trust a channel, some YouTube channel or whatever the channel is, and they just want to be kind of fed this information. And so what we're, and I think other, you know, people who are creating apps and, and user experiences for content, you guys may to some degree have to deal with this, is how do you give them, how do you do both? How do you make sure that the people that are fluent, that have some money, actually, it, it appeals to them, but you're also kind of bringing on new users that, that don't really want that user experience. So I think I could come up with a lot of those examples. There's a lot of... Uh, is there an uh, engagement differential between those? Is it like one where they're just wash, it's washing over them and one where they're searching it out? That's a good point. I definitely think in the in kind of more engaged, I'm going to curate the content, there is right. more engagement there. And certainly those people tend to have more money, so that's important. So that sounds right like now. music and the way music yeah. you listen to or you love. Right, right. So I think there's lots of those challenges that you kind of have to do that, that all of these, it's, it's another one, it's another challenge that companies who are, are um, creating apps, right? If, if we're going to expect all of these content creators to create thousands of apps, all of these content creators essentially have to know their audience, and if their audience spans both, you know, all of these generations, you've got to build a, an app that does that, or d does all those things, and sometimes that's just impossible. So it's just another challenge that, uh, that we've got. So, so talking about age, um, let's talk about <laughs> the younger demographics, and let's talk about a technology that I think a lot of people are starting to experiment with and starting to explore is VR, right? So what does the television experience look like in terms of virtual reality? Is it, you know, are we all going to be watching with headsets on our faces? Is it going to be all 360 degree video? You know, what do you think about VR and its impact on television? So I, I think I want to counter your young generation and VR association okay. because I know a lot of people not young who are really enthusiastic about VR. Perfect. So um, I think there's, I mean, the, the, um, so we're spending a lot of time on like thinking around VR and I think there's, there's this concept of taking an old medium and applying it to a new one as it, right? Because like, you know, normally there's a cinema and I have a movie and in VR I'm sitting in a virtual cinema and there's a vi virtual movie screen. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of those things, um, you know, expanding it to 180 and 360, there's a lot of other things we can do today pretty quickly to create experiences that are um, visualizing something that normally would only be possible if you actually, at the event, at the live event, with 360 video, or with a more immersive experience in a, in a movie environment, maybe with social interaction of people interacting in that movie theater. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, but I really feel like this is pretty much the same what you had on your slides at the beginning when people were looking at the television and were looking at this, oh, maybe, you know, maybe it's, I think there was this one slide where this, you know, people come out of the television, I don't know, whatever that <laughs> was. So, I mean, I think we're exactly at this point. We don't know yet how to use it. We know it's very powerful. We know the technology is there. Um, we know it's, you know, there's definitely a big driver for it, which is, which is, I think, initially really gaming. There's a lot of advantages for, you know, people trying to experience, doing, you know, storytelling and gaming, I probably would say, a driver's video also, but more the 180, 360 experiences that are mapped from traditional experience. Obviously, there's a lot of things around 360, like the camera settings and 
how to produce it. But I think we're just at the beginning. I think probably in, in five years from now, we're going to have another slide deck. It's like, hey, look, in 2016, we thought VR was <laughs> taking the old media and putting it into a new. And then um, in 2021, we're going to look at it as like, oh, we happen, they, they didn't even think about you know, this volumetric camera. Anything else I mean, that's going to come. Yeah, and for what it's worth, I agree. I think, I think it's going to be a really important, cool option that we're going to have moving forward, but I don't think it fundamentally changes things. I don't think all TV is going to be VR. You know, there's going to be cool things that you can do on Friday night and get an immersive experience, but, um, and, I, and, I, and I don't even want to minimize that. I think it's really important. It's going to get better and better and better, but it's not going to fundamentally, that's not going to be the way TV is consumed five years from now or even 10 years from now. I think it's a separate thing, and precisely because it does occlude everything else, and you've got all these people, you know, people watch TV, and it's not just the TV. They have their phone and their tablet and their laptop, and if you're going to be in a VR experience, you're really shut in, and are people willing to shed those devices and be in, in this experience? And also, um, being in the headset's uncomfortable. I mean, you know, there are, there are sports training facilities which use the VR to help professional athletes get better at sports, and they found that Time spent in headsets, like 10 minutes, and people get tired about tired of it. And these are really motivated users. And so until the headsets change, I don't think it's going to be really um, a great thing. It's like, what was the barrier with 3D TV? The glasses. And those glasses were no way as heavy and cumbersome. And you know, I, I think AR is more likely to be you know, you see like Pokemon Go, and imagine if you had a film where you could walk around a city and unlock bits of the story, and how engaging that could be, and how that could also be monetized and put into with businesses. I mean, the opportunities there, you can just, you can see it right away, and it could happen quicker. Whereas I think to your point about, you know, how the, how you even think about VR um, from a directing point of view, if the if the user is the director, you've got to cue them by using sound so they pay attention in certain ways. The entire experience is, is in its infancy from a, an artistic standpoint as well. I think, sorry, <laughs> it's for your turn, but I just want to comment on this. <laughs> so I, I, think there is, um, I think there's a crossover from traditional media to VR. I think there are ways to, to make that appealing. Like I'm just thinking about a baseball game where you're in the middle of the audience, right? And I think there's also techniques where you can map, uh, uh, let's say, a live stream to a VR environment. So you, let's say you're in, a, um, you know, in a, uh, a room in the stadium, and maybe just that area in front of you is video and everything else is like a 3D environment. So there's ways, I think, to make that interesting. Um, what I, I feel like personally is like there's a lot of things that are very interesting around storytelling in VR, which is not necessarily always video. It's sometimes just really literally objects. Um, and I mean, this, but, you know, with the, with Facebook, um, I think Oculus Story Studios, I think is the, is the brand. Um, what they're doing, and the experiments are very impressive. I mean, that's like the Pixar version two, basically, to a certain degree. Right. So I think, I think we're early. I think there is a crossover from media. I don't think it's going to replace it. I think it's not an either or. I think with 3D, the situation was, it was basically just that. And it couldn't go anywhere, right? It's right. like, this is the experience. It's going to stay like this. You know, people are not comfortable, it's not going to change. I think we, with VR and AR, I think there's a lot of room to make things like create a next generation experience. So, mm. let's see what that's going to be. Yeah, I mean, not much to add beyond, at least from our perspective, we're test banning all kinds of um, uh, different alternatives because it, it does represent a very, um, a, in a sense, a very fertile ground of uh, extending the experience and engagement with the customer. Um, I, but it's, it's really more about, and to, to piggyback on what was said before, it's just, it's just another level of segmentation of the media experience. It's, I mean, passive, active, right? VR, augmented, is very active. Passive, and it can't be underestimated, but people love to have media wash over them and be <laughs> passive and just watch content and let it happen. Um, as opposed to, you know, very active, whether it's headset-based, whether it's augmented reality, whether it's screen-based. Um, it's a functionally different experience where it, I don't, and to agree, I don't know if it necessarily replaces, but it, it is a meaningful way of engaging a certain subset of uh, the users out there. All right, so, so here comes the last question. It's kind of a, an obvious question at this point in, in the panel discussion. I'd like to hear from everybody. Um, maybe if you can just spend, you know, 
30 seconds, 25 seconds, 20 seconds, something, you know, as, sort of, as fast as you possibly can. What do you think is the future of television? What's it going to look like? We'll start with Roger. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, 20 seconds. Future of television. Absolutely fragmented. Uh, I, I, I think you're going to see overall numbers of classic metrics, you know, Nielsen-based stuff. I think you'll probably see uh, a decline in overall numbers, but there's just going to be a factor of just so much more content now. Um, I, between, I think it was 93 to 2003, there was 10 times the amount of music that was created, um, just discrete songs. I think that's going to happen here in, in, in video content. Uh, if it hasn't it already, already it already is. <laughs> uh, so I, I think the overall level of reach and content that's out there right now is just, it's for what's being consumed and what people are liking and viewing, um, it's, it's actually a good time. <laughs> if you, most people enjoy, or at least an increasing number of people are, are enjoying a lot more media consumption. Um, it's, it's a very good time because it's just so much more content available to them. Oh, am I next? <laughs> you are going next. down the line. If, if I had the answer, I'd be a really rich woman. Yeah. Um, so I don't have the answer. I wish. That's um, a good answer. All right, well, that's my answer then. <laughs> you don't really know. Your turn. Okay. We'll move on to Keith. I'm going to put my whole team on this whole inject TV into the brain thing. <laughs> starting that, uh, that was a pretty cool that's, answer. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, so I agree uh, with everything Roger said, I, I, but I do think um, that five years is a long time, and I do think, uh, uh, although there's going to be a lot more content being made available, I think uh, users are going to be given more control over that. I do think this kind of universal guide, universal search, universal recommendation stuff will be solved to a large degree and actually make sense of all that content. It's just such a great opportunity for someone to, to, someone to figure out. So. That's what I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope that in you know, what's the time spent? Five years. 15? Five years. Five yeah. years. Yeah. I mean, I hope that the um, the content will be really the winner of this. So meaning that we maintain to have high quality content, like HBO shows, Netflix shows, and have give others the ability to produce their own content in a less fragmented way than it is today. I mean, it's sort of the counter to to um, Rodolfo's fears here that's going to be very fragmented. But I hope that there will be at some point in alignment where a television will be smarter to take over that control better or other instances will be able to control this better. I think the, the, the worst would be is, you know, great content goes away and gets replaced with, you know, low produced content and, and, on mass. I think that would be a problem, but I think it's on the same side, if you don't get to that millennium content and don't get that on the same big screen, if that's on the same 4K HDR, so, um, Dolby Atmos experience, if, if you can get that sort of like really it, all, all that matters is the content and not just if it's a premium source or, you know, an independent um, um, producer, I think that, that would be a great vision if that is going to happen. Maybe Apple does it, maybe Samsung does it, but that would be great. And, and uh, I'll even take a, a different pivot. I think, I know from my perspective, shameless plug, that, um, that <laughs> We certainly, uh, at least this workforce that needs to power this digital media <laughs> revolution that we're on, is not necessarily keeping pace with the number of open heads. <laughs> I know everyone's effectively hiring across the board, and we certainly are, uh, definitely are, shameless plug again. But it fundamentally has to change the educational pipeline of what people study as far as applied sciences apart um, from engineering backgrounds and, and things like that actually have to keep pace with. So you mean um, solving the problem Yeah, it's, is the challenge? Because effectively, a, a lot of what happens is, you know, we're poaching from each other because it, this is a very dis defined set of skills. Um, but when you're pulling in entry level or rank and file folks from your traditional, you know, college pipelines and cues like that, um, it's, it's actually quite challenging. It hasn't been able to keep pace. You know what, though, those people also need to take design courses because mm -hmm. it can't just be, I mean, the look of it, like Apple, why was Apple so successful? It's the user experience. And as a user, I don't care how, I don't need to know the tech. Mm -hmm. I just want it to look nice and be easy and intuitive. Right. You know, and so marrying those two Absolutely. things is really important. 
Yeah, I was remiss in saying only engineering based, but yeah, it is. <laughs> the creatives matter. Creatives and arts, um, arts disciplines as well. All right, so we've got time for one or two audience questions. And there are hands that have gone up sort of right in the middle. If you can speak loudly, I'll repeat your question. So let, let me repeat that question. So the question is, you know, what do you guys think of the internet as it relates to the problems with watching, you know, lots of TV and the cost of subscriptions? Well, it, what you're experiencing though is exactly what the cable companies want. If you would only buy cable, all your problems <laughs> would go away. Or virtual MVPD. But um, <laughs> it, well, it's two two questions, right? Um, I, I think it's somewhat unique in the sense of your appetite is that wide for buying that many subscriptions, but you know that's great. <laughs> um, but I, I, I don't, I don't know if that's a, a wide enough description of what people's appetites are for. I, I, I think it's a probably it's, it's a subset of what folks' appetites for subscription subscription plays are, um, which probably brings you further into whether it's a cable box or it's a platform aggregate aggregator that uh, brings a product together. As far as latency on streaming, that's a, I can certainly talk to you about that afterwards. But. <laughs> that's a whole discussion in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, so I think you're basically saying is like, I get cheap internet if I get the cable subscription. If I don't have my cable subscription, my internet is very expensive. And I need the additional subscription, right? The math behind it doesn't add up. No, yeah. Nope. Well, so they'll give you like cheap cable just to have cheaper internet. Mm -hmm. But it's going to mm -hmm. cost way more than the, the TV and then you factor in your phone. Like I don't I don't see the future going very far until you solve that problem. Well, but that's the economic that's on purpose. Yeah, I, I mean, So I, I mean it's like their business model. Yay. Um but it screws all everyone else over to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. But if you have ad supported content, <laughs> you don't have that problem. So <laughs> there you go. There we go. Counter Right, okay. All right, we've got time for one more quick question. Right there. Just have a comment. Um, because we never talk about it in the show, but the ad business is a couple things. One, it's undergoing a transition that's just as big as what's happening in the, in the media sure. space in general. And so that, it's not really figured out yet. So with all due respect, um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. The, the, the ad space is in a big transition right now anyway. And whatever, it, whatever way it works now, it's not going to really work that way in the next year. The second thing to add is that in order to make any money with advertising, you need a massive amount of impressions. And, and so this is why most companies that are doing OTT that are, have little offerings and mid-sized offerings just can't make money with ads in the next year if you don't have a sheer volume of ads. You need a lot of ads. Right. I mean, that's, we have millions of users, and we still don't have enough users to make it worth our while, which is why I'm not an ad expert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So the, the last thing, and I've been doing this for 20 years, streaming, and the transition, man, they just take way longer than you think. Mm -hmm. Way, way longer. MLB, I, I started working on that in 2001. So it's pretty good now, but that's, that's 15 years, right? Yeah, I would say within that 15 years, we probably... <laughs> made the leap forward, but 2001 was very early days. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with you. I, I, what, well, yeah, and when I mentioned, you know, ad tech being in the tweens, it, it was, um, in a sense, from a concurrency perspective or viewership perspective, yeah. um, that, that's part of it as well, you know. There's the one, the execution side, and there's, two the, the actual volume that's required to make this uh, viable. But I, I think, at least from the, the growth curves or consumption curves and viewership, it's going to get there. But it is 
it's not going to get there as as and I agree with you. It's not going to get there necessarily in um, in a rapid or in immediate amount of time. Yep. Well, they have, but they also have. They've sometimes they've pulled back. I mean, Turner is reducing their ad load on on like True TV. They've pulled back their ad load. I know they've reduced it other places as well, like Saturday Night Live reduced their ad load, precisely because it's offensive to people. They, it dilutes their brand and their brand power. Um, so I, I I don't know. But I, it's also that. I mean, I think one targeted ad can be more impactful well, than 10 ads that are not targeted, right? I mean. Well, I think that's a measurement issue. So if, if it's just purely impressions and engagement, but if you could say who you're hitting, that's where, so as, as the measurements are shifting, and as, you know, right now it's Nielsen, but as it shifts over to some of these other ways of looking at it, then perhaps, you know, it becomes more worthwhile. All right. So. Oh. Yeah, if you guys if you guys want to take it offline, I kind of want to. We need to wrap this up. Um, so if uh, we can have a hand for our wonderful panel up here, I think they did a fantastic job.